When we're young, we have an amazing, positive outlook about how great life is going to be, but somewhere along the line, we forget to dream and end up settling. Join Up Dots features amazing people who refuse to give up and chose to go after their dreams. This is your blueprint for greatness. So here's your host, live from the back of his garden in the UK, David Ralph. Yes, hello there once more. Welcome to Join Up Dots out there in internet land. We've got a great one today and I've been looking forward to this one since it was uh, pre-booked many, many months ago. Today's guest has quite simply packed more into his last few years than many people do in a lifetime. And I guess, unlike many people who want to make their mark on the world, he started at such a low point that these achievements would have probably seemed impossible to others, but not to him. Diagnosed as depressed, overweight, with limited motivation, he knew he had to do something and do something fast. And so he asked himself some deep questions, such as, why am I here? He got his answers and then started taking action. And when you start achieving things in your life, you create a momentum that is unstoppable and leads you to greater and greater belief that everything is possible, a complete turnaround to where he was at the beginning. His professional life began flourishing, his personal life improved, and after creating his own company, publishing his first bestseller, SEO Secrets, presenting to crowds of interested folk who flocked to hear his message, he knew it was time to reevaluate once more. He increased his focus on self-development and happiness and created his first life list, which quite simply, he states, was the best decision he ever made. Setting himself a target to achieve 150 things by May the 25th, 2017, he set off on an adventure which is nothing short of inspiring. He lost 60 pounds, ran a marathon, sold or donated all these possessions until only owning about 100 things, paid off all these debts, became much more spiritual, visited all seven continents, reconnected with friends and family. And if that wasn't enough, he became happier than he'd ever been before. And with items such as flying a plane, being on a chat show, seeing Mount Everest, getting a six pack, and actually living in the wilderness for a month, being just a few items on the list, you can see it's a stretch of belief as much as perseverance. So let's introduce today's guest, And we'll see if being a guest on Join Up Dots was on his list too. And I tell you, I'd be disappointed if it wasn't. Welcome to the show, Mr. Life List himself, Danny Dover. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. David, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely great to have you here. And that is the first question I need to ask on that list was being a guest on Join Up Dots. And I'll be disappointed if you lie to me, sir. (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, I have a policy not to add things, but for you, I could make an exception. Thank you very much. You can squeeze it on at 151 or 152 and then just sort of cross, right. cross it off when you get the urge. Um, you've, you've had an amazing life, haven't you? Um, as I said it's sort of in, in the introduction, when we first booked in this, um, this interview, I started sort of reading things about you. And the more I read, the more I wanted to talk to you because it, it's, been a, a, it's been a wow in such a short few years. Does it, does it amaze you really when you sort of look back and, and think where you were to where you are now, what's actually occurred? Absolutely. Uh, I live an entirely different life now. And more importantly than that, I'm, I'm happier and other people note that. Uh, and I think I've, I've been lucky enough that I've, ever, I've been able to make other people happier as well through going through this journey. Why do you think that? Why why are people becoming happier because of your ventures? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, the people who are important in my life, who I think love me, they see me happier and that makes them happier. Um, But more to a direct point, I've been able to involve a lot of people with these with these lifeless items that I've been doing. Uh, So it's very common now that when I'm doing a a lifeless item, I'm with um, one or more people who are important to me. So if we sort of go right back to the very beginning in the sort of, us, we, we call it the dark ages of your life, mm-hmm. um, your family and your friends love the Danny Dover that you are now. They're happier because you're happier. Did they realize that you was in such a dark state at that time or was it just such a gradual progression over a period of time? Like when a son is getting taller and taller and taller you don't see it because you're in the same house as him was was that the case or were they aware that you were not in a happy place uh well actually i think it's exactly like the sun analogy that you used it, it took a long time for me to get to that dark space and i think that's how it was able to sneak up on me uh, there wasn't a quick fix because i didn't understand that there was a problem and the people around me didn't understand that there was a problem until i really hit uh, rock bottom 
And at that point, uh, I realized I needed a big fix, and that's when I started working on it. But what 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 was the cause of of the depression, the dark phase there? Because you seem to have most things that other people had at that time of your life. You had a loving family, you had a support network, but was it just a dark cloud that had come across you or was there situations that sort of led to it? You know, it, it really was not black and white. I don't think there was one specific element that had created it. I think it was just um, one, a chemical imbalance in my brain and two, uh, just a general feeling of being stagnant. Because I, I was talking the other day to a gentleman called Stephen Shewak, and um, he is the mentor and he, he helps men um, develop relationships and deal with sort of personal problems. And he was saying that he was in a very dark phase for a long period of his life, probably the first sort of 30 years of his life. And he hated anyone on the positive side of the fence because they couldn't quite understand why he was feeling that way and they would generally say you know what have you got to worry about pull yourself together you know don't worry about it life could be worse um i'm somebody who really i'm very very fortunate i've never had a dark phase in my life at all i've always been on the happy side of the fence um would i have irritated you at that time of your life being in a positive state or were you somebody that went to work, played a part, but then sort of um, went back into that, that, that protective zone once you got home? Sure. So I don't think I would have been annoyed by someone who was expressing positive energy. If anything, I think I would have been jealous uh, because that was something I wanted to experience myself. There were elements of my life that were going well, but I was really lacking fulfillment. And that's what was wearing out. out. That's what was wearing at me day by day. So, so what was going well for you? Well, I think I was comfortable. So there wasn't anything that was going extremely well. I don't think I was in a, any kind of romantic relationship. I had a family that I was pretty close to, but we could have been closer. Um, money, I was doing okay, but I certainly wasn't rich. Um, and I was kind of getting by. Really, in, gen- in life, a, a good way to describe it was I was getting by. Things were sort of happening, but certainly not fast and, and not any direction that was planned. So, so you, you're the same as millions and millions of other people. Well, I, I call it contentment zone. Life isn't too bad, but you do anything about it. It isn't too good, but you celebrate it. You just sort of plod on day after day after day. Exactly. I was just kind of going through the motions because that, was in, at that time in my life, that was the only option that I saw. Well, what was your, your plan in life before then? Because obviously we are <laughs> going to come on to the life list, Um that, that's not the major part of the conversation, but that's certainly something that sort of a, would interest most of the listeners because I think that is something that most of the listeners, if they had the chance, um, would like to do that. But away from the sort of the fantasy side of, of your lifestyle, when you was um, sort of a young boy before you started going off to work and that, what, what was your plan in life? What were you looking forward to doing? Well, I certainly didn't have a plan. Uh, I knew what I enjoyed. I knew that I really was passionate about the internet, but I didn't know what that meant. Uh, there wasn't any degree that you can get in the internet, and, uh, and mo- well, in most cases, there isn't even till today. Even today, uh, I knew that 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 is what I what I love, but I didn't know anything more than that. Maybe I had a, a goal, a rough goal, and that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to do it. Well, what was your first computer then? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, this would go way back, and it was some kind of gateway computer, and I, I can't honestly tell you any of the, the specs of it. I guess actually now that I think about it, the, the first computer I got was in my elementary school. I grew up in Redmond, uh, which is where Microsoft is, and okay. at the time, Apple, Apple was doing a war with Microsoft over getting, tech, getting technology in schools, and so I was a lucky benefactor of that. Uh, so the first computer I actually used was a Mac. Uh, I know that it was terminal based so it couldn't start up by itself it had to use a mainframe but i don't remember the which model it was i, I think my first one I, I go back even further was either a commodore vic 20 or a commodore 64 mm. do you remember those ones mm-hmm. i do i've actually done a fair amount of research on those just because it comes up fairly often in discussions like this yeah they do and you used to have a big ram pack they used to jam in the back mm-hmm. to sort of play games and and play tapes and stuff very archaic um it is it's unbelievable now really when you look back on those days how excited we were on on things that were so 
unbelievably primitive. You know, that there was no way that you could have imagined plugging into a computer and speaking to somebody across the Atlantic Ocean as easily as we're doing now. Um, and I would be surprised even if the guys creating the internet um, at that time could have perceived really where we could go with it now. Yep, I absolutely agree. Uh, that's I, I feel very lucky to be living now and that it was such an incredible time uh, with so much opportunity with technology and really, I think, in make, making humanity better. Did you think there is um, more opportunity because of the internet, but sort of positive? Because it is, there's, there's an equal ability for good and bad on the internet, isn't there? You know, it, sure. So the, so the internet is just like any tool. It, it, it can do, it can only enable you to do other things, but how you want to use it is up to you or up to the individual who's taking part. So, so what's your favorite thing on, on computers? You, you sit at home and a lot of your life is based professionally around the internet and PCs and SEO. So what, right. what, what is your fun element of life when you're actually sitting at home doing computer work? Sure. So the, the part that draws me to the internet that I just, I really love is that we have the most remarkable system that we've ever come, that humanity's ever coming up, ever come up with. And the things that people are using it for just blow my mind, right? It's a lot of like, porn and lolcats and silly cartoons when really we have more computing power than like <laughs> than than could be imaginable and just the juxtaposition there uh and just the randomness of what's going on and the freedom of information that allows just blows my mind and entertains me every day i don't know if you know the answer to this but i i've heard this two or three times and it might be an urban myth but you're more sort of clued up on the sort of the the, the background um of the internet but I've heard about three or four times that 90% of the internet is based around pornography. Do you think that's true or is that just a figure that people band about? Uh, I think that's actually a myth. So if you look at it from a data perspective, and I'll only go into this briefly, uh, most of the traffic that's going on the internet uh, is either torrents or movies. And there's no way for us to know if that's adult content or not. Um, but with streaming services like Netflix especially, it's looking like it's legitimate. or um, and Legitimate is not the right word, but more um, common movies or more uh, culturally acceptable movies, that kind of thing. So, so where, where would you like to take the computers? I'm, I'm going to get off this theme, but it's, it's interesting me at the moment, so I'm going to sure. go with it. Um, where would you like the internet to be able to go in the next few years? Have you got anything in your head that you, you sit there thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if it can do this, but at the moment we're not at that point? Sure. So... Um, Ubiquity is what I would was what I would like. So I want that in both the internet and a computer. So there's a there's a famous paper that was written at Xerox Park, I believe in the 80s, uh, called Ubiquitous Computing, and it was about this idea that computers are eventually get to a state where it's as common and ubiquitous and cheap as paper. So you just you do something on it and then throw it away yeah. and never think twice about it. And I want to get that direction. And then the other part of this is with internet connection itself. It needs to be extremely fast. It needs to be wireless. It needs to be global. So we're move, we're slowly moving there, but it's not it's not quite where I want it to be. So speed and ease of access for everyone. That, that's, Every single person. Yes, exactly right. Because that, that, that would really blow everything open, wouldn't it? If, if some mm -hmm. child in, in a village in the middle of Africa has got, you know, Wi-Fi connection and the ability to self-educate, I suppose, um, it would certainly take the world. And it would certainly, I, I suppose, solve a lot of the problems out there that are caused by simple lack of education. I think that's exactly right. Uh, one of the things that inspires me a lot about the technology community is that many people are self-taught. They just got it because they have a, a love for learning and technology was their school. So it, with your travels around the world, with your 150 life list points, have you gone into towns and just thought to yourself, I could do something amazing here just by providing them one PC? Or is it as not as easy as that because they haven't got the infrastructure, the Wi-Fi, and, and all the other bits that you need to sort of tie on? Well, it's certainly a large problem. Um, and I don't actually think that just providing the computer is, is, the, is the answer there. So there's a, uh, there's a nonprofit called, um, uh, oh, I don't remember. I'll have to look it up and send it to you in the show notes. But it was about uh, one laptop per child. That actually may be the name of it. Uh, and they found that even though this had wireless access and it was an extremely cheap computer, I think it was less than $100, uh, that this didn't turn out to be the solution because the infrastructure didn't exist yet. So other companies like Google are trying to fix the infrastructure. Um, one of the more interesting projects is using uh, balloons in the atmosphere. 
to provide uh, wireless routers over uh, remote areas in Africa and Australia right now. Which is, once again, is, is amazing that they're even considering that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. Okay, Danny, um, what I want to do is just jump back to when your life started sort of moving forward, when you took those those positive statements of intent and you asked those questions, and they're, they're, they're incredibly deep questions, but almost simple as well in their structure. Um, why am I here? What made you think those questions in the first place when, when you're s- sitting at home knowing that you're not in a good place knowing that you've got to do something about it what made you actually ask those kind of questions because I don't think I would have done I think I would have just stumbled into something and then tried to stumble into something else but it's almost like you you structured a plan is that because of the way that your brain generally works because you're involved in sort of computers and structure and that kind of thing um what 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 brought that along? Well, I don't know exactly. Um, I can tell you that when I was suffering from depression, my main symptom was that I didn't have any motivation. Uh, and the result of this was that I was spending a lot of time doing absolutely nothing. So what I tried to do was start asking me some questions. Why am I not doing something? And by following that line of reason, I always ended up with this question of why am I here? What, what am I doing? Uh, and then I started, I started tackling that. And I uh, started doing a little bit of research. Um, when you're, when I was diagnosed with depression and when I was going through the process, um, I wasn't really accomplishing anything. Like I had things that I wanted to do or knew that I had to do. I was in school at the time and just failing out in the process of doing that. Um, so I would, I found just talking to people was kind of the easiest thing to do, and started to realize, at least in my mind, that the answer to why are you here doesn't really matter. The the more important aspect of it is just choosing something and committing yourself to that. Uh, so when I, when I came to that conclusion, I was like, okay, that sounds right to me, but I don't know how to attack that. I didn't have any, very much money at the time. I certainly didn't have any motivation. Uh, I don't even think I owned a car, so I wouldn't even be able to get to these kind of places. Yeah. But uh, um, started chipping away at that just a little bit at a time, and that, I think, is how I started to make progress. The, the hardest part of any major project in life is just overcoming inertia, is getting the momentum that's required to get through the hard parts. Which, so that's that's what I started to do. Which is what what I touched on in the um in the introduction. Once you start to take action, you build up a, a belief system. You can actually see things happening around you. Where at the beginning, you you must have sat there going, "This isn't going to work. I might as well do what I'm doing now." You know, uh, having all those doubts and fears that everybody has when they go into something new. So it's. It really is fascinating for me that you say that you've got lack of motivation, but to be able to do that and break free from your surroundings is probably one of the most motivational things you've ever done and you will ever do. I, I, don't, quite, I, I don't quite get how you can do that at that point. If you're at your lowest of your low, how you suddenly manage to break free from the quicksand and start making that sort of momentum. Well, it was very slow and um, things that were very easy for me to accomplish at the beginning. And I did this, um, I can't say I did this purposely, I did this out of necessity. It was the only, the only things that I could do. So creating a list itself was not, that was not particularly hard. Um, but, tack- but what I was able to do is start tackling the things that were very, very low-hanging fruit. Uh, so I think the first thing that I did was get a straight razor shave. And the reason I did that was because I needed to shave anyways. <laughs> so... I, that just helped me get the first item done. I actually saw your TED speech, and um, there is that that photo of you in in a living room with a lady with a quite mm-hmm. a quite a, a Tom Selleck moustache you had going on there. <laughs> yeah, I still get uh, comments about that. So uh, I don't know what I was doing at that point. That was a that was a bad call. But the straight razor shave, unfortunately, was just uh, from the mustache down. I should have been wised up and uh, <laughs> and kept going with it. Yeah, because that is not that. I don't think that ever was a good look, other than for Tom Tom no, Selleck no, no. and porn stars. I think they're the only ones that have those kind of moustaches. I think you're absolutely right. I also was quite overweight and uh, just had a lot of stuff going on in my life at that point, so I wasn't. <laughs> I was not uh, a hot item. <laughs> oh, I don't know. There's there's a market for everyone out there. I guess so. I guess so. There's a lot of people out there. Yeah, which is the beauty of the internet. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's there's, right. a, there's a market for everyone. So so you you went out and had your shave, um, mm-hmm. and then you did what? What's the, what was the next thing? Can you remember the next thing? 
I believe the next thing was a trip that my family had scheduled for me. Uh, so I wasn't actually required to do that. It wasn't far away. I want to say it was um, visiting family, I think, three hours away. So this one started to move the needle a little bit on travel. So that item wasn't actually itself a bucket list item, but it was pushing me in the direction of, hey, you have these abilities to travel, even if you're just a tourist in your own town or your own state in this example. And and did you want to do that travel, or was did you did you feel pushed into it because well, your parents were arranging it? Well, I mean, it, it's kind of funny. So travel is one of those things that I think everybody wants to do. They, I mean, travel is the closest we have traveling uh, location is the closest we have to time traveling. And I so I think everyone wants to, but there's lots of excuses that come up. Mm. Uh, travel is it can be expensive in many cases is, uh, and it's certainly a new. You have to overcome a lot of things that are outside of your routine, and there's going to be a lot of unknowns, and all that stuff is very scary. So while I did say I wanted to travel, I think I was still frightened by it. Uh, so at that point, just by making a small little trip, uh, that helped break down those walls a little bit. It certainly didn't break them down entirely, but it helped it helped me start start making progress. Because I, I don't think I would have done that trip myself. I, I have a kind of character flaw, I suppose, that if I feel I'm being pushed into anything, I then suddenly get my heels in and I'm not going to do it. If somebody had sort of asked me quite politely, would you like to come? It will do us a great favor. I'm, I'm likely to go. But if I felt that they were arranging a trip just to push me out of my comfort zone, it would never happen. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, I think I was just tired of when I was at my lowest point, I wasn't really doing anything. I mean, I'd basically spend all day in bed. So I don't think I was even saying no yeah. <laughs> at that point or, or, or even going and bothering doing the arguments. I was just finally fine and just kind of going through the going through the motions, like I mentioned. Just get pushed across to Auntie Lynn or wherever you were going. Yeah, exactly. Now, actually setting up your list, had you, had you already pub- published your, your book and built your first company? I, I, I couldn't quite get to the gist of whether the list was the starting point of everything or the list came after. I, I kind of sensed it, it was an after and it was the momentum that you'd created actually getting out of bed and going off to your relatives, having a shave, kind of incremental mm-hmm. um, challenges had pushed your, your professional side um, to the forefront and then the list building came afterwards. Would I be right in that? Well, it happened kind of at the same time. So the first iteration of the list was actually from when I was very young, and it had a lot of things on it that were not even possible. So it was won a Super Bowl, um, an Academy Award, and I think a Tony all in the same year. Um, so these were things that weren't even possible, but it was it was kind of the seed of an idea. So I think I stumbled upon that and was just kind of laughing about it, and then took off the things that uh, weren't important to me. So one of the things was owning, I think it was a Lamborghini and a Ferrari and uh, some other uh, supercar all at the same time. And it was, that stuff's not important to me, and it wasn't when I was even when I was dealing with this. Mm. So doing the initial iterations on the list, that came around the same time uh, when I went to go get that shave and do that little trip. Uh, the next step in this was just talking to friends and family about what had made uh, an impact on their life, what was something that was truly important. And after we got through all of the crap, it ended up being things like adventures they'd had, times and experiences they'd had with people they cared about, and um, like either, either travel places they went or food that they'd eaten. So I was like, okay, I like these themes. And this kept coming up again and again with different people in different parts of my life. Uh, And then from there, I started taking their suggestions and adding them to what became my list that I have today. Um, And then after I gained a little more momentum, kept buying people. My little trick that I was using was uh, buy coffee for people who I really respected, who I might not otherwise get a meeting with. And it turns out that people, um, some of these people were quite successful in their own right, either through various awards um, because of their professional work or because they'd just been doing quite well and say their family work or, or whatnot, uh, they were willing to grab coffee with me and tell me about what had been meaningful in their life. And from that, I, I created the list. And then from there, it happened ongoing as I was pulling myself out of out of depression. Because that, that's a, a, a key point to the majority of conversations that I've been having with people. Um, that if you reach out for somebody who is kind of untouchable in your mind when you start to create momentum for yourself quite often they're willing to give you time just the fact that you're here now speaking to me you don't know me from adam this is the first time that we've ever connected but you allocated time to a complete stranger because they asked for help it's it still blows my mind every single day that i sit there and i think okay i've got danny dover today 
wow, this is going to be amazing. I can get to, you know, tap into the brain of somebody who is is so far in advance to where I am with the challenges that he's overcome and the experiences he's had, but he still says yes. Does that surprise you still when you sit down for a cup of coffee with people or are you at a level now where you're sort of, your, your, your fame is spreading and you're known for numerous things and it's, it's more a level playing field? Well, so there's actually two things here and I learned these much later in my, in my career or in my life. Uh, the first thing is a great way to meet somebody is to interview them um, because people are generally quite vain and they, they want to have an interview about them. Uh, people <laughs> enjoy talking about themselves. Uh, and I'm certainly no exception to that. And so if someone asks me for an interview, that's a really, really great way. And so I, I go through and do interviews of other people so that I have a chance to meet them and talk with them. And that's been really helpful. The second part of this is that there's a lot of other things that are happening in the background. Like, in fact, this theme of joining up the dots. You had reached out to me and I, I, I caught on to the reference to the Steve Jobs speech um, because one of the major influences in my life when I was going through in the beginning stages of pulling myself out was also that same commencement speech made by Steve Jobs, uh, specifically his part about dogma. Mm. And that part really struck me a lot, and that's kind of a, poor, a core part of my story, or at least what I've been striving to do. And so you made that connection with me, uh, probably without you even knowing it. It's just that we have that in common. Yeah. A lot of times when you reach out to people, there'll be something like that. Maybe it'll be some off comment you make. It's something that you don't plan. It's certainly not strategic. Uh, but that's the reason that while people will say yes when you don't expect them to because there's something that is not quite under your control or something that you understand that's also making an impact. With, with the speech, it is, it is iconic, isn't it? It's, it's gone down in history. And I would love to know, and I've said this numerous times to people, but I would love to know whether when he was writing it, he thought, oh, God, I've got to do a speech tomorrow. I better throw down a few ideas. Or he thought, right, okay, I'm not very well at the moment. I'm struggling health-wise, I need to leave something very profound for, for generations. Because it is something that I've only met one person who's said to me, oh, I don't know that. And bear in mind, you know, he, he's an American businessman, and a lot of us are over in this sort of United Kingdom and the world. But it, it's travelled. It really has travelled. And it's the simplicity that I think makes it so effective. I'm going to play it now. And then just the, the centre part, the theme to the show. And then I just want to sort of ask you if you could remember when you first heard it and how it sort of made, made you feel. You, you've already said there's a connection to that. So um, I just want to delve into that a little bit more. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college. But it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. Now, you've obviously heard that and read that 20, 30, 100 times, whatever it is. Does it still have the same impact on you now hearing that? than it did the first time. It does, because I think every time that I hear it, I understand a little bit more how true it is. I think that's really why this touched so many people, because it's one of those universal truths, uh, or at least it certainly seems like it is, and it's those things that really make an impact on humanity. Do you think your path was destiny? Do you think karma did play a part in where you are today? Um. Well, I don't know about destiny exactly, but I think that karma played a bit in that by by treating others like you'd like to be treated, uh, things tend to turn out better. And I think that that, that absolutely made an impact on, on this experience. In, in, in what way, though, treating people? Because I, I had a manager years ago, and the, the thing that people always used to say was, treat people as you would like to be treated. And mm -hmm. this, this manager once said to me, no. That's wrong. And I said, what do you mean it's wrong? And he said, no, you need to treat people as they would want to be treated. And it had a sort of fundamental shift in my brain that day. And I thought, yeah, that's right. How can I be presumptuous about treating them the way that I would like? I've got to sort of get under their skin. Um, so how do you go about that? How do you connect with people and treat them in the right way? If, you, if you're meeting, you, you know, you're meeting hundreds of people, I imagine, now. 
on, on almost a daily basis. How do you manage to connect with all those people to leave a positive um, result from that interaction? Well, I don't think there, I don't think it's a, uh, a formula or, or strategy or anything. I just, I just try to, I try to treat people the way that I would like to be treated if I was meeting another individual. Uh, I think it's just kind of as simple as that. I, I don't have any framework or, or, or tips in that regard. I, I just do what feels right and follow that and react to the conversation as it's going through and um, just try to keep positive. Do the same things work worldwide, Danny? You know, I, I found they have, uh, especially, so language is a big, is a big um, issue you'll run into as you're traveling internationally. Uh, and I've found that body language is extremely expressive, uh, eye contact extremely expressive, uh, simple, polite touches extremely expressive. And I've found that those things, from what I've experienced at least, are, are universal. When, when you've been in sort of really remote places, I've, I've traveled quite extensively and I find that the times when I can't actually speak their language are the times that I almost make a deeper connection with them because it is all based on body language. Have you experienced that kind of thing? I have. And you know, it's funny. Um, I think a lot of language is just small talk. A lot of the conversations we have, you aren't really saying anything. But when you remove that medium for communication, then the only things that are left are things that are more true and more, I'd say, universal. Um, and so because of that, you can't, it's impossible to have small talk. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I think that makes an impact on people. It, everything becomes raw, doesn't it? Raw and open mm -hmm. and, and sort of genuine on that. Has, mm -hmm. has there been any places where you've, you've traveled, because it's on the list, and actually I'm going to sort of ask a wider question on this, because you're, you're sitting down there 10 years ago, whatever it was, um, no, probably about five years ago, and um, you were writing these 150 things. And when you look at them, some of these are kind of mind-blowing because I've tried to write my own list today. And you get to 10 quite easy and you get to 20 and then 30 is becoming a bit sort of fantasy world and 40. So to write 150 things, has there been anything on there? And I just need to sort of preempt this. You have got two rules. Could you tell the um, listeners what the rules on the list are? Sure. Uh, so the rules are I cannot remove or add anything to the list. Uh, and I must complete the entire list in its, um, without any modifications before May 25th, 2017. And how did you actually benchmark that date? Uh, so I, one of the, no, one of the, um, let me think about this. So I arbitrarily picked it, although I do want to say that it was my birthday. And actually that was not that the reason I picked up this date was because that's a date that's important to me, but I did not choose it because it was my birthday. I was just the first one that came to mind. Hmm. And then I got that tattooed as my deadline. And where did you get it tattooed? <laughs> I got it tattooed on my butt. You, you, now, I, I picked that up in your, your, your TED speech. And mm -hmm. um, if anybody's seen that, go onto YouTube and, and type in and, and Danny Dover TED speech and you'll, you'll find um, his presentation. And at the very last minute, a lady comes on and sort of asks mm -hmm. you that question. And then the video cuts off. Did you actually show your bum to the audience? <laughs> uh, I did not. I did, I did not. I, I've made a policy of not doing that so, uh, because you know. So no, <laughs> I just don't think that. No one's seen it. No one's seen it. Other, uh, other than your mum and stuff. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it backwards in mirrors many times. <laughs> that was something I didn't think about until after I got the tattoo. And there's been some other key people in my life who've seen it. Yeah, that's right. Because I suppose what you should have done is like like the words ambulance is always written backwards so you can see it in your rear right. view mirror you should have had right. it done in reverse so when you're in the mirror it, it makes sense to yep. you i suppose if anyone is thinking about getting a tattoo on the back side of their body this is this is certainly something to keep in mind this is a key point in in every every, <laughs> every show i want to have a message out to people that they can take away <laughs> and if you are thinking of tattooing your backside do it in reverse so you can see it in the mirror. <laughs> I, th I think that that's. Right. I think we've hit the point of the show there. I think that is. It is. I think that's the fundamental point. Now, <laughs> getting back to the actual sort of list, as I was saying, you, you're writing 150 things and you're sort of whizzing down. You can't take anything off. Mm -hmm. There must be things that once you get to them are similar to other things that you've done and you haven't liked. You can't like all of them. And are there some things that you're kind of leaving to the bottom of the list because you think, oh, I don't really fancy this. I know I've put it on there, but actually I'll, I'll leave that to the very last. Well, not exactly. So there, I haven't found any two items to be similar because most of the list, I think about 
well, it might not be most. I think it's only about a third, maybe a little more than that, is travel related. So going to one city has elements that are like going to another international city, but there's different experiences that happen at each of them, and there's different people that meet each of them. So that makes them unique and interesting. Uh, the one that I've been putting off a lot uh, is getting a patent. So I have an idea and a, a process for evaluating expertise. Uh, and then I have a, a process written out for that. It's documented. Um, but I have not actually started the paperwork. I'm not a fan of doing lots of rigorous paperwork and, and spending the money to do this. So this is one that I've been putting off. Because I wouldn't put that on the list. It, if, if there was anything too hard or, oh, I don't really fancy that, I don't think I would have put it on the list in the first place. You, you must have known what you were like at that stage. If, if you're lacking motivation to even get out of bed, the thought of doing something which is so removed to you now in your powerful superhero state, I can't see, I can't see how it got on the list in the first place. Well, so that came from a meeting with some coworkers who had just gotten a patent, and they said that this was one of the most meaning thing, meaningful things that happened in their life. And I actually talked, about, talked to them about them yesterday. I met up with them again uh, and asked them about this, and they said that, yes, that was still one of the most meaningful things they've done in their life. So I'm happy I have it on my list. I haven't experienced it yet. I haven't done it, uh, but I have high hopes. What has been the craziest thing that you, when, when you were actually doing it, you were thinking, number one, I can't believe I put this on the list. And number two, I, I can't believe that everyone doesn't do this because it's so amazing. <laughs> okay, I have a few answers to that. Um, so I have uh, pickpocketing, learning how to do that. That's something that was just incredibly stressful and um, nerve wracking and uh, just a lot, it was much more mental than it was learning the techniques with the sleight of hand. Uh, so there's that. There is something I did last week, which was experience zero gravity, which was absolutely fantastic. And then there was Argentina. But I want to talk more about Argentina. So Argentina, I moved to Buenos Aires. This was my first major. Um, this was my first major bucket list item that I did. Uh, so prior to that, I had only traveled internationally to neighboring countries, um, and. Uh, this one, I was ready to jump ship. I had just been fired from my job. Uh, I had a little, this was farther in the process for context. Uh, so I had a little bit of money saved up and I knew that there was a lot of bucket list items that had to happen in South America. I did some research, um, uh, checked with some people who I really respected. Um, so I had read a lot of their work and then seen that they had lived in Buenos Aires uh, and made that leap. And that one was one of the most important ones on my list for me from a development perspective. Uh, because after I was able to leave the country that I was born in, uh, go to a country that I had knew almost nothing about, I didn't speak the language, I didn't know what I was doing, I wasn't sure how initially how I was going to make money. Uh, after I got over that and realized that I'd be okay, then I really established a lot of trust in myself. And that's what was able to propel me uh, forward after that event. Getting back to pickpocketing, that's cri <laughs> that's criminal. It is, it, it is. This is actually this is actually one of the reasons why this one was so hard, and so you had, you had mentioned crazy, and I agree with that. Uh, so my whole life I've been taught not to steal, and it, and it doesn't feel good to steal. Uh, so this one was very hard, not because of the technique itself, but because you actually had to do it. So when I did it, it was in Seattle. I was back in the area where I had grown up at the time, and um, I'll give the short version of this. Uh, so I was at a uh, big uh, big party event, it was, um, like a big music event. And I was telling myself, okay, this is a perfect time to do it based on my training I'd done before. And found someone who had, it was a holiday event, or it was Halloween, so people were dressed up in costumes. And found someone dressed up as a tourist. And I was like, okay, well, this situation is perfect. <laughs> so I ended, up, I ended up using the techniques that I'd learned. I kind of moved, got into the person's bubble without being intimidating about it. Um, danced there on, in an unthreatening way. Uh, bumped up against them a few times just so they'd be generally okay with the idea in a subconscious level. And then did it real quick. They had a fanny pack on and um, just grabbed it from there. Walked away to make sure I get away, and then went back to the person and gave it back. Uh, so I wasn't actually doing any theft. That way, I could make it, me feel good about it. The funny thing was that when I did that and gave it back, the person said, "Oh, thank you, bro," and tried to hand me money as a reward, <laughs> and, <laughs> which I promptly turned down. But <laughs> thought that was quite funny. You've got morals, I, I guess. Yeah. But but where where do you where do you learn pickpocketing? Because I've never seen an advert. Do you want to be a pickpocket? Do you want to make a quick, easy buck by stealing off a stranger's? Come, come to evening classes, four hours a week for five weeks, and we will teach you. How do you find somebody that can teach you to pickpocket and become a criminal? <laughs> so that was one of the hurdles I ran into with this bucket list item was that I, when I looked around, I first just Googled around and then um, started going through Amazon and trying to see if there were any books about it. I couldn't find any good sources uh, because the people who are doing this well don't want to teach it to other people. 
So what I eventually did was when I was living first in Argentina is I would just sit down, um, have coffee at an outdoor location and just watch people pickpocketing. So there was usually younger people. So I would just watch their techniques and that would, that would be it. Uh, and then in Spain, I did something very similar. I was living in Barcelona at the time and I just found a great uh, cafe on, on uh, Los Ramblas, which is where a lot of uh, tourists hang out and unfortunately a lot of pickpocketers. And I spotted this guy who would pickpocket somebody and then every single time he would do it, immediately afterwards, a nearby police officer would kind of nod at him and kind of give him a stern look and then the guy would give back whatever he had taken. And he just did that loop all day. He never got anything out of it. And I still don't understand that part of the story. I don't know why that happened. I think maybe they were related. That's what I got from body language. Um, and this guy was just spending his time doing that. But but from that, I could watch him do the same cycle over and over and over again so that I can internalize it. Can you, can you still pickpocket now? I haven't tried. Um, but I imagine I still could. I, I feel like you are a Fagin character, and you're you're luring me into a criminal underworld. <laughs> you know you know the internet too well, and now you're you're a master on the street as well. I don't know about a master, but uh, I was able to do it successfully once. Right. Okay. I'm not I'm not going to press this too much, but Danny, no one is listening to this show. It's just you and me. Okay. If anyone is listening, can you just turn it down now? Are there any other criminal things on your list? Uh, there were. Uh, so uh, you can read the list for yourself and you know, I'll, I'll let you identify them that way. <laughs> <laughs> right. What, what's, what's the major one that you've got left? Because I saw that you want to see Mount Everest, but you didn't say that you mm -hmm. want to climb up Mount Everest. I don't. Um, having talking to people who have done it, it doesn't seem like that's something I want to do. It takes a first of all, it takes a lot of money. I think the permits alone are, are thirty thousand dollars US. I never realized uh, and that. Then, yeah, it's just the permits alone, uh, and then the process takes a whole lot of time, and it's a lot of sacrifice that I don't, I don't want to do with me. I'd rather spend my time doing other things. Um, but I do plan on going to base camp, so that's my general plan there. And uh, honestly, I don't have that item figured out quite yet. But they, but, but, uh, but the Nepalese government. Um, I assume they are the ones who own own Everest. If anyone owns it, maybe God owns it. Who knows? Um, mm -hmm. They must be making a fortune because I, I read there's something like a hundred people going up it every day or coming down it every day. You have this image in your head that it's just one or two people clinging to a little pickaxe as they as they go up, but there's not. There's masses of people going up and down it, and they're all paying thirty thousand. Yeah, I don't know the specifics exactly how the taxes are distributed, but um, those are the numbers that I've heard. I've also heard that um, there you now run into traffic jams with people, uh, and that you can't go up every single day. Um, obviously, you wouldn't probably want to attempt it at all in the winter. Uh, so you do it during the summer, but you can't do it any day in the summer because you have to get the conditions just right. So on the rare days where it's like, where it's okay to do a climb, you actually run into a situation where there's too many people on the on the thing, which is the reason I believe they at, they do permits. I've got a chap coming on the show soon who is the world record holder for going up Everest, and he's been to the summit eleven times. And he's, he's yes, so he's got a br uh, so he, brilliant name, Kenton Cole. How fantastic is that for going up the top of Everest? Now, the, now the person who I was referring to uh, when I was just saying though is I believe it's the same person. So this is not someone who I know well by any means, but he gave a speech. Um, wherever I was at the time, and I went and talked to him just briefly afterwards, so I, I'm sure he has no idea who I am. But he was the one who had actually convinced me not to want to climb Mount Everest. Well, he, he, I, I don't know why he would do it 11 times, because I, I can only perceive that, A, it must get a bit boring. Well, the first time must be amazing, it must be exhilarating, and the second time must be pretty good as well. By the time you get to about 9 or 10, it must be like going mm -hmm. to see Titanic 10 times at the pictures. <laughs> you know, you, you must oh, it's, it's still quite a good film, but my God. And to keep that kind of level of focus, to keep going up it and keep coming down it alive when so many people have died, that, right. that to me is, is when, I, when I talk to him, it's going to be the key point to the discussion. How do you remain on your game time and time and time? Um, but I suppose the same question goes to you because you are on your game all the time. To be able to achieve what you have, um, it's not something that you just get out of bed and go, right, what am I going to do today? There's there's a certain amount of planning towards it. How how do you achieve that planning while still doing your your professional life and your your business commitments? Sure. So I have a trick to maintain momentum. So uh, as I'm doing every bucket list item, I make sure 
that I have the next one already pre-planned. So that means I get the lodging and transportation and event if it's if required already in progress. So that way I never run into a situation where I don't already have one in process. Uh, and then as far as the say moment the mental um, momentum, I mean I just I just enjoy it. I mean I wake up every day excited to do this. I think for the last three years I've averaged one of these bucket list items every every week. I think it's what, yeah that's what the math works out too. So I just enjoy it. This is this is what brings happiness to me, and this is what this is what keeps me uh, up late at night and waking up super early to get this stuff done. I, I think it's super exciting. I really do. You know, as I say, I I struggled to write a list, um, and I don't know if I would have the commitment. You know, I, one of one of the things I would like to do is order a coffee from Starbucks without giving them my name. That that would be a <laughs> that'd be a good thing. I, I don't know why they do that all the time, but um, just kind of like little challenges that I can sort of overcome. Um, because I I don't think I have. I don't think I have the brain to be able to structure a list which is doable. I think I would instantly go into fantasy world, as you were saying with the Tonys and the Oscars and all those kind of things. I think that's where I would go and quickly lose momentum. So the, the, I'm sure there's hundreds of people that have done sort of, you know, life lists and bucket lists, but the only two that really strike a chord is yourself. And I think it was John Goddard who was a chap who, yes. who did... Yeah. 127 on his list or something which is, which is a weird number i don't know why he didn't round it up but um <laughs> he achieved something like 109 are, are you sort of um aware of of the work of mr goddard who unfortunately is no longer with us uh, uh yes i certainly am so i've read he's wrote two books i've read them twice i have tried to meet him uh we i found out later actually that we had been living in the same town <laughs> in glendale california uh, but unfortunately i never uh, the timing, I didn't know he was living there when I was living there, and then I found out later. So, no, I've never met him, but, uh, yeah, he's certainly been an inspiration of mine, and he was a big influencer early on in this process. So when, when you come to the end, it's May the 26th, 2017, and you've ticked May the 25th, actually. Uh, but once you finish, so you, you finish it on May the 25th, oh, I see. and the next day you're laying in bed, and you suddenly think, what do I do? Are, are you going to sort of go through the... Um, Game of Thrones box sets, or you know, what what what, <laughs> what, what what's going to take up your time? Can can you imagine that that far down the line? Yeah, so I've thought about this a lot uh, because it's inevitable; it's going to happen, and I think I'll actually finish my list a few years early. Uh, so what I am in the process of doing now is writing a book about the experience, uh, and so that'll be my big project immediately after I finish is is publishing that and um, doing that promotional part of it. And then immediately after that, I want to transition into a TV show. So I want to take the spotlight off of me and the things that I've done, and I want to put that onto other people. So the idea here would be enabling other people to do it by providing them with the resources. So sometimes it's just expertise, sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's just by giving them the time if that's if that's something I'm able to do. Uh, so that's that's what I plan on doing after this list. So you're going to have herds of pickpocketers going around the world. <laughs> Or people ta- tattooing their backsides willy nilly. That's right. That's how I'm going to finance all of this is with a with a gang of pickpocketers. Perfect. That that is perfect. Yeah. Just bringing us to the end, Danny. I've I've loved this conversation, and I, I really, you know, I, I I could have gone into so many sort of interesting areas, or gone on to episode two, three, four, five. But I'm aware that the time's ticking away. Um, the the end part of the the show is very much what we call the sermon on the mic where I hand over the presenting duties to you and you get a chance to really go back in time and speak to your younger self about what your your beliefs and your sort of understanding of what can be achieved in life if you take a certain amount of action and a certain amount of paths um, towards a a common goal. So I'm going to play a little tune now that we lead into it and as it fades out, I'm just going to leave the presenting duties to you. I'm going to remain quiet because I'm sure you've heard enough from me tonight and um, I'd be interested to what you would actually say to your younger self. This is the sermon on the mic. Here we go with the best bit of the show. The sermon on the mic. The sermon on the mic. Hello, little Danny. Uh, There's one thing that I want to take away from this rant is that life has absolutely no speed limit. So right now you're going through the early stages of school and you're realizing that some of the classes seem really idiotic and dumb and the speed doesn't seem quite right for you. 
And this is something that I want you to take away for the rest of your life. Life really has no speed limit. Um, school and eventually work is set up many times for the lowest common denominator. And in some, life, some aspects of your life, you certainly are the lowest common denominator. But in others, you're not. And it's important to realize that you can actually play things at your own speed. Uh, I spent way too much time trying to figure out what the purpose of my life was and what the focus was. So if I could go back now and talk to you and skip a couple steps, I would ask myself, I would, I would aim for three things. I'd focus on three different ideas. So finding something that you do all three of these things with, something that you love, something that helps people, and something that makes money. And if you're able to find this one thing that has all three of those criteria, you can use this as your target, uh, you're going to be very, very successful. And I don't mean successful because you're going to make a lot of money necessarily, but you're going to be successful as far as fulfill fulfillment. I can tell you now, uh, being, being older than you and having the same body, that those, that's what's ultimately going to make you happy, is finding fulfillment by something that you love, something that helps people, and something that makes money. Uh, if you're having trouble trying to find that, there's certain questions you can ask yourself. Uh, so the big, biggest one is, uh, what's your purpose? Why are you here? And that's a very broad question. It's difficult to answer. Uh, so if you need something more specific, ask yourself, what gave you energy this week? Uh, there's lots of things that take energy out of you by working or school or homework or whatever. So if you can find what gave you energy, that helps you identify what you love. Uh, if, if The next question would be, what can you do to make others smile? So focusing on that smile, because this is one of those universal language things that I've seen in every culture at this point, or every culture I've visited. And that'll help you identify what helps people. And the third thing is, what can you produce that provides value to others? So the goal here is never about money in the bank account. It's about giving you the tool that you need to accomplish what you do. We live in a world that you need money in order to do it, but the, the important thing here is not to overemphasize on growing your bank account, but just to to be able to fund the things that you want to do. So again, focus on something that you love, something that helps people, and something that makes money by asking those three questions. Danny, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being so generous, so open, and of course talkative. And I wish you so much um, good luck for the for the rest of your 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 life and the second 150 list or whatever you, you plan to do. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the door is always open on this show to return. If there's anything you want to air, anything you want to rant, whatever you want to get off your chest, um, please give us a, a call because I believe that joining up those dots is the only way to build your future. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. David doesn't want you to become a faded version of the brilliant self you were once to become. So he's put together an amazing guide for you called the eight pieces of advice that every successful entrepreneur practices, including the two that changed his life. Head over to joinupdots.com to download this amazing guide for free, and we'll see you tomorrow on Join Up Dots.